um, it's great to see everybody as I scroll through your wonderful faces. Um, let's. Start. Marcus, you must work for Divine Distillers if they, you say that. What? I didn't get that. I didn't hear that quite. He, he said he said that there's still plenty of time for things to go wrong. And I said, he oh. must work for me. <laughs> uh oh, that's not good, Jason. Okay, we'll get the meeting started. And um, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and again, if you have a guest like Mark Hunter has, if you want to drop it in the chat so I, we make sure and call on you or if you're a visiting Rotarian or you have an announcement that you wanna make, if you'd pop that in the chat. Thanks, Renee. Um, so I make sure that we don't miss you. Um, so with that, if, if uh, saw your note, Chuck. Um, Rabbi Eli, are you with us? I am here, yes. Okay, looking forward to your invocation and, and um, inspirational words. Okay. Uh, today I'm sharing something from my tradition, um, and so I need to make the disclaimer since all these are supposed to be <laughs> um, ecumenical. I'm not telling you what to think. I'm just sharing something with you because I think it's a universal teaching, so forgive me if it's not, okay? Um, so during this time of year, we go through a whole, um, Jews go through a whole self-reflective process, and it happens that this week, the process, the the, the, the thing that we're thinking about is bonding, about connection with other people. So on this particular day, we're looking at the quality of compassion within, within the quality of bonding. So compassion within the quality of bonding. So uh, I'm sharing with you the teaching that I'm learning this, this um, year. And so it says of today, bonding needs to be not only loving, but also compassionate feeling your friend's pain and empathizing with them. And we are told to um, focus on these questions, is my bonding with other people conditional? And do I withdraw when I am uncomfortable with my, with my friend's troubles? And the exercise we have for today during this time of year on this particular day of this year is to offer help and support in dealing with an ordeal of someone with whom you bond. So wanted to share that with you since it seemed apropos of today's presentation um, and all of our lives during COVID. So hope it's a blessing. Thank you, Rabbi. Appreciate that very much. Good, wonderful food for thought, right? Um, all right, so um, I'd like to move on to guests and we'll start with Mark Hunter. Yes, thank you, President Sue, fellow Rotarians. Um, hopefully, I, well, not hopefully, for the last time, I'll be introducing Elena Harvey as my guest. Uh, she is the public relations lead at Union Gospel Mission. And next week, it uh, looks like we'll be doing her induction into the club. So please welcome Elena Harvey. Hi, Elena. Looking forward to you becoming a member. Um, thank you, Allison. I'm going to go to Renee next as a guest. My guest today, again, is my daughter-in-law, Archana. Bapa Sherpa. She's the Director of Facilities Management and Procurement at the Oregon Department of Justice and the mother of our granddaughter, Maya. Very Welcome, good. Welcome. Ashana. Welcome. It's good to have you again. Uh, and then Allison, you have a guest. I do, President Sue and fellow Rotarians. It's my pleasure to again introduce Jonathan Partridge, who's the Community Engagement and Development Director for Liberty House and has been approved for membership. Good to see you, Jonathan. Welcome, Jonathan. Yeah, we'll work on the, on your induction date as well. So we'll get to that right away. So thanks thanks for everybody that, that uh, has brought a guest today. Um, I don't see any visiting Rotarians nor club announcements. So on to you, Rick Galpo for Bell Ringers. 
and you're muted. Rick, you're muted. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share a screen. And I, there we go. I'm sharing now, I presume. You are. All right. Uh, we are bell ringers. Our first bell ringer is for um, it, uh, Elise Bauman is ringing the bell. Uh, it is. Matching May at Salem Harvest. For the entire month, your donation to help feed hungry families by harvesting fresh fruits and vegetables will be matched up to $10,000, doubling your impact within, within the community. This means your $50 donation will harvest 624 pounds of fresh food in May. Donate $100 and well over a half ton of healthy food will be provided uh, to help to families feeding thousands of people in our community. Two dedicated Salem Harvest supporters and Rotary Club Salem members, Larry Connick and Dewey Witten, have generously pledged the majority of these matching funds. Don't let their generosity be lost. Make your donation today at salemharvest.org or reach out to Elise for more information. Ring the bell. That's exciting, Elise. All right. <laughs> On to bell number two, we have uh, Warren and Linda Bednars are ringing the bell for their daughter, Stephanie. She's been working for the last month as office manager and executive assistant for a Salem startup called Trinata. They manufacture steel building panels to provide affordable house home building solutions. Stephanie is organizing a housing, a hiring fair. Stephanie is organizing a hiring fair for the company on Saturday, May 22nd, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. They are seeking production technicians and apprentices. Anybody interested, call Stephanie, 888 414 4150. We are proud of Stephanie and the in new innovative company, Trinata. Ring the bell for Stephanie Bednarz and Trinata. All right, one more. Shane Griggs is ringing the bell for past district governor, Renee Campbell for her presentation during last weekend's virtual district conference. The picture here is related to this sentence right here. She inspired the participants with her thoughts on continuing the great work of Rotary Clubs provide while still looking at new ways to encourage current members and potential new members. We should all be so proud that Renee is a member of our club. Ring the bell for Renee. And that is our bell ringers. So may I do one from the floor, Rick? You may do one from the floor. All righty. Oh, and then John McCulley. John McCulley, you go first. OK, um, <laughs> in light of the article in the sports page of the paper this morning, I want to ring the bell uh, for the um, athletic department at North Salem High School for the work they did to accommodate yeah the uh, baseball players at McKay who didn't have a team this year and now they do. So ring the bell for the North Salem High Athletic Department. That was a really cool thing that, that they did. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, my bell ringer, I put it in the, the e-blast so I feel obligated to do a bell ringer. Um, but my husband, Gene, and I just celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary um, wow. over the weekend. So um, our kids are very proud of us, as are our parents. So, yeah. Just keep were plugging along, right? Were well, you a child bride? Yes, indeed, I was. I graduated high school, college when I was 18. Yeah. No. So <laughs> it's all good. So it's, um, it was a fun celebration. So thank you Allison, for that. Allison has a bell ringer. Very good. Go ahead, Allison. Oh, 
the You're on mute, Allison. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, President Sue, fellow Rotarians. I'm going to read off six numbers and then I'll explain those. 530, 17, 700, 10, 90, and 50,000. So what does that have to do with anything? We are nearing the end of our Liberty House Spring Mega Raffle and 530 is for 530 tomorrow night. If you click on a link that'll be on the Liberty House website, you can join our live stream. We're gonna be drawing one of the 15 grand prizes and over 200 other prizes. Um, and so it'll be really exciting. We're gonna do those grand prize drawings beginning at 5.30 and you do not have to have bought a ticket, but in case you wanna buy a ticket, you still can go to the Liberty House website. Jonathan, I might ask you to put that link in the chat and really exciting. I mean, trips and all really cool stuff. So why do we need your support? 17 is the next number I read. Last year in our clinic, even with the shutdown and schools closed and everything, we saw 17% more children in our clinic for concerns of abuse or neglect. That's almost 700 children. We saw 10% more children in our therapy program. Um, and our total impact in the year 2020 is we served over 1,200 children in our community and also some of their caregivers in therapy. Um, and it is just amazing. We are really trying hard to um, be the very best resource we can and we need all the help we can get. Um, 50,000 is the number of a matching grant. We have had a very generous donor say that they will match dollar for dollar every donation that we receive also from tomorrow night and also um, throughout the next month for um, up to $50,000. So we really encourage you to join us and donate and that will make it possible for us to reach our goal and serve children in our community. And I see that Jonathan has just put the link in our, in our chat room. So thank you very much for all of your support for Liberty House and children in our community. Thank you, Allison. Uh, then um, Jason has a bell ringer. I just find it funny that I go right after Allison because I was going to bring up the Liberty House uh, <laughs> auction this, and that was going to be my bell ringer. So it will still be my bell ringer, but I just think it's really funny because she did a lot better job than I would have ever, ever done of bringing it up. So <laughs> that's my bell ringer. Okay, very good. Thank you for reinforcing Allison's bell ringer then, right? <laughs> um I don't, I don't see any more okay all righty thank you rick and thank you everybody for your bell ringer. thank you all okay um we are up to program time so i'm going to hand it off to chain ch to chain as an elect chain that was a that was a hard word wasn't it for me yeah um, so off to you chain thank you president sue it's my pleasure to chair today's program, and I've been looking forward to hearing from this presenter, who I am pretty sure has the world record for the number of speaking engagements. Just, I counted off, the, off of her information, over 100 appearances in front of Rotary Clubs across the country. That's just the Rotary Clubs, and she has had many more contacts than that. But before I get to Sherry, I'd like to introduce my virtual head table, uh, my first guest is Trisha Frizzell, who is the Program Director for Home Youth Services, which is part of the Mid Willamette Valley Community Action. But you probably know Trisha more for her fabulous bell ringing skills and her baby goats, which I just love. So thank you, Trisha, for agreeing to be at the table. Uh, my next guest at the table is Chi Wen who is currently the interim deputy CEO of the Oregon Food Bank and the Salem Area Mass Transit District's board treasurer. She is one of the many of the Rotarians who I've missed seeing at our live meetings because we don't have them. Uh, and I'm so excited that you're here today, Chi, to join the table. Thank you. So moving on to our program, Sherry Storm has been a member of the Rotary Club of Emerald City since 2006. She spent 16 years as an executive at a credit union, and she's now the CEO of a consulting company called Category 6. Her book, Motherhood is the New MBA, Using Your Parenting Skills to Be a Better Boss, so intriguing, was published by St. Martin's Press. With almost 20,000 copies sold, it has been translated and published in China, 
and was purchased for publication in Brazil. She speaks around the country on a variety of topics, and you can also see her TEDx talks on her website, sherrystorm.com. Sherry grew up in sunny Kennewick and now lives in Edmonds, Washington with her movie-making husband, that just sounds glamorous right there, are her three teenage daughters and a dog named Cedar. So please join me in welcoming Sherry Storm. Thank you. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes, good, okay. So thank you for um, having me today. I'm gonna set my timer so that I don't go over. I have about 23 minutes, yes. Um, thank you for having me today. A little bit more about me. I had um, been an executive for many years before I had children. I now have three, Rebecca, Lexi, and Joe. And I found once I had children, I was actually better at my job. I was a better problem solver. I was more create, creative. I had more empathy. I had more patience. I had more perspective. I found to be being a working mom to be something that was actually good for my career, which was the opposite of everything I had told would be the case up until that point. And so I got sort of caught up in this idea that being a working parent can make you better at your job. So caught up in fact, that I thought maybe I will write a book. Have any of you ever done that? I'm gonna look at the gallery here. You find a new passion and you think maybe I'll write a book or start a blog or a podcast. I'm not seeing any vigorous head nodding. You know, that's what I like about Oregonians. You're, you're sensible folk. No, I'm just kidding. If you want to <laughs> write a book, you should do it. You should do it. Um, so this idea kicked around in my head for about two years until one day I was at work and I had suspected that a coworker had done something. And so I asked her about it. And as she began to answer me, I looked at her and I thought, wait a minute. I know that. Oh, I know that look. That is the look my two-year-old gives me when I ask her, Rebecca, did you just put your sneaker in the toilet? And she looks at me and says, no, it must have been daddy. It's a look she's giving me when she's lying to me, right? So it occurred to me at that moment that human nature is human nature, whether we're two or we're 92, we're pretty much hardwired the same way. When you're a parent, you deal with human nature up close, unfiltered, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I thought, aha, that's the idea for my book right there. Being a parent can make you a better boss. So... I pitched the idea and I pitched the idea and I pitched the idea and finally a publishing house got back to me and they said, well, we like the idea, but what we're really in the market for this year is an advice book to which I said, oh my God, guess what? I'd love to give advice. As a matter of fact, mixed to my opinion, this is my favorite thing to give other people. So I signed a deal with St. Martin's Press. And when the book first came out, when my book first came out, it got a lot of publicity. And the reason it got a lot of publicity is this, in our country, in our culture, the way that we think about, the way that we talk about, the way that we teach business really revolves around two metaphors. And those metaphors are battle or sports. And these metaphors are problematic. Now, I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna say this loud and clear and, and, and it's important that you hear it. I'm not disparaging the military. There is a lot to be learned from the military and I will, I will never dispute that. And I'm not saying that there's a, not a lot of good that comes from organized sports because I truly believe there is. But what I am saying is, if you view your business like a battlefield, you run the risk of leaving out some very important components like compassion, nurturing environments, mutually beneficial outcomes. More importantly to me though, is if we continue to think about, teach and talk about business in terms of sports, we neglect women's role in sports and our relationship to sports. Most women don't have the same relationship to sports that most men do. Now, whenever I'm in, when I do this in, in, in person, uh, I always have one woman who raises her hand and tells me emphatically, I voluntarily pay for 159 channels of ESPN and I religiously watch everything from golf to full contact MMA body boxing. And I love to listen to hockey on the radio. That's not typical, right? That's not, that's, that's, that's atypical. But more importantly to me is that women aren't, we're not leaders on the national stage when it comes to sports in our country. We have fantastic, hardworking, talented female athletes. They don't garden the same fame or fortune as their male counterparts. So what I am saying is there is room for a third metaphor and that metaphor is family. Now, because when you, when you talk about business in terms of family, now you're talking about a metaphor that's compassionate and nurturing and has women in very visible leadership roles. That was a very long preamble to get to this story because this is a story I actually want to tell you. When my book first came out, 
And I started getting a lot of press. I loved being a celebrity. I did. I loved it. But my mom, she was totally nonplussed. I would call my mom up and she would say, I would say, mom, guess what? I'm going to be on Martha Stewart this week. And I'm on the cover of the Metro News New York. And she'd say, "Uh uh-huh. I call my mom. I said, mom, I'm in Time Magazine this week and Red Book Magazine. And she'd say, "Uh uh-huh. Finally, one day my phone rang and it was my mother's voice. She said, you're in the Costco connection? Apparently I'd arrived. So I'm a professional public speaker. This is what I do for a living. This is how I make my money. Everything changed drastically for me as I'm sure it did for for almost everyone on the call today on uh, March 4th of 10th of last year. um, I had to drastically change not only what I talked about, but how I presented because Presenting on Zoom is much different than presenting in real life. And so I I thank you with much gratitude for letting me practice my craft on you today. My presentation keeps evolving as things keep evolving in our world. And now what I've been talking about is this. What the heck just happened? So (laughs) what I want to do is I want to take sort of hopefully a humorous look about what just happened in the past 13 months and then give you three pieces of advice for maintaining strong bonds for those who care about most as we re-enter the world um, after this pandemic. So let's take a let's take a walk down memory lane. The first thing that happens, we have these really unique stressors, right? We have these abrupt physical disruptions. Um, many of us started working from home with no fair warning. And um, if you're anything like this woman, if you uh, st- uh, um, uh, abruptly started working from home, you're probably working in some weird corner of your house and some weird ergonomically incorrect desk me me I have the fun thing of I have to make sure my my head stays right in the middle of the screen because if I go like this you can see into my messy kitchen (laughs) if you had children in the past year they were probably doing some type of hybrid or online learning regardless of what their school looked like they were probably underfoot and maybe you didn't have kids but you have pets and maybe you didn't have kids underfoot you had cats over keyboards who would have thought that our pets would become a professional consideration but here we are uh we everyone's been on edge we spent we spent we spent a long time on edge haven't we and when the pandemic first started i found this quote we're not all in the same boat but we are all in the same storm which like two weeks into the pandemic really spoke to me and i thought was poetic Uh, That quickly changed because what happened in our country is we were all on edge. We were all worried about very similar things. We were worried about the health of ourselves and our loved ones. We were worried about the economy, certainly worried about politics, but we had drastically opposing viewpoints on who the culprit was, who was at fault and what the solution needed to be. And so what that created, and then you, you, you layer onto that, the fact that a lot of us were on some sort of social media, like Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And um, what happened is that we, we became a, a country of very contentious opinions, right? And it's stressful. It's stressful when somebody you like or love has opposing viewpoints from you. It's particularly, it's especially in particular stressful when people you admire or respect have sometimes diametrically opposing viewpoints and that really reared its head last year, didn't it? We have a lot of landmines and, um, and things that, that make people angry that you, that you, you might not guess. Uh, and then lastly, there's a lot of uncertainty. All right, so I'm gonna play a video for you. And this might be the very last time I play it. I keep thinking, I keep thinking this is the last time because the video is actually a year, old, oh, 13 months old. It was produced last April. It's, it is a three minute long video that is just humorous. It's just, it's a satire, parody, whatever. It's a, it's a joke. But watch this video and ask yourself, 14 months into the pandemic, how much has really changed in terms of our understanding of the coronavirus? So I'm going to play this right now. Go like this if you can't hear her. Yeah, I really don't understand why everybody isn't following the same rules right now. They're very clear. So let's take a minute and let's go over them again. First, you must not leave the house for any reason. 
unless of course you have a reason and then you may leave the house. All stores are closed except those that are open and all stores must close unless of course they need to stay open. This virus is deadly but don't be afraid of it. It can only kill people who are vulnerable and also those who are not vulnerable. We should stay locked down until the virus stops infecting people. And it will only stop infecting people if enough of us get infected that we build immunity. So it is very important that we get infected and also do not get infected. You should not go to the doctor's office or the hospital unless you have to go there unless of course you are too sick to go there. This virus has no effect on children except for those children in which it affects. The virus remains active on different surfaces for two hours or four hours or six hours, but in most cases it's days and not hours and it needs a damp environment or a cold environment that is warm and dry in the air unless the air is plastic. Schools are closed, so you need to homeschool your children unless you can send them to school because you are not home. If you are at home, you can school your children using various portals and online classrooms unless you have poor internet, more than one child, only one computer, or you are working from home. Baking cakes can be considered math, science, or art. If you are home educating, you can include household chores within their education curriculum. And if you are home educating, you may start drinking at approximately 10 a.m. every day. If you are not home educating children, you may also start drinking at approximately 10 a.m. Masks are useless at protecting you against the virus but you still need to wear one because it can save lives. And in some cases it may even be mandatory, but also maybe not. You must not go to work, but you can get another job at which point you may go to work. Stay home. I don't know how many more celebrities we need to have tell you how important it is to go outside and take care of your mental health. There is no shortage of groceries in the supermarket. There are simply many things missing. You don't need to go buy a bunch of toilet paper, but you should buy some in case you need it. If you are sick, you may go out once you are better, but those in your household, they cannot go out once you are better, unless of course they need to go out. Animals are not affected by the virus, except for that cat that tested positive in Belgium in February, plus a couple tigers. The number of corona related deaths will be announced daily, but we don't know how many people are infected because we were only testing those who are almost dead to determine if that's what they will die of. The people who die of corona who are not counted won't or will be counted, but maybe not. To help protect yourself during these times, you should be eating well and exercising, but exercising only eating what you have at home to avoid going to the stores unless you need toilet paper or a fence panel. It's important to get fresh air, but don't go to parks, but but do go walk in other places. Just don't sit down unless you are old or pregnant. But if you do sit down, don't sit for too long unless you are old and you are pregnant, in which case you need to sit down. But if you do sit down, don't eat unless you've had a long walk, which you are allowed to do if you are old or pregnant, except for times in which you aren't. Don't visit old people, but you have a moral obligation to take care of old people and bring them food and medicine. And finally, no businesses will go down due to coronavirus, except those businesses that go down due to COVID-19. I hope this cleared up any questions about what we should and should not be doing during this time. Please educate your friends and family with this information so we can remove any and all confusion surrounding this time. Thank you. So, I, I, I'm, so some things have, have some things have, have not changed uh, in terms of like what we're certain about. And I, you can add vaccines into that. Like, I think there's a lot of confusion about what people believe about vaccines also. And, and maybe, hopefully, maybe, I don't know, we're, we're past the point in the pandemic where we're all drinking at 10 a.m. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. You know what? Who am I to judge? Um, so three pieces of advice based on these unique stressors we just lived through. The first is yeah, I really um, to be mindful of your communication methods. Okay. Zoom's here to stay, right? It's, 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 it's going to be in our lives for, for the foreseeable future. But one of the things I want to caution you about is when and how you use Zoom. Um, so this is my, my, my piece of advice for this. Use voice when you have to deal with anything sensitive and also mix up Zoom and voice. And, and this is what I mean by this. Um, well, I'll tell you in a story. Last summer, this summer, last summer, uh, I had to have a, a sensitive conversation with our incoming Rotary president. And uh, so I sent him an email. So Joan, we talked to you about something and it was sensitive. And um, he said, well, let's get on Zoom. I said, okay. So we get on Zoom and I, and I had practiced what I wanted to say. So I took a deep breath and I said my piece. And when I was done, I looked at Joel and Joel looked like this. Because Joel had frozen, right? Of course, Joel had frozen. So when Joel unfreezes, he says to me, oh, sorry, you froze. Didn't hear you. Can you say it again? 
So I took a deep breath and I said my thing again. And you know what? The call ended just fine. He handled it like a pro, of course. And there was a resolution I wanted. But when I got off the call, I still had this low grade weird anxiety. So I did a little research. Here's two things you might not know about Zoom. Number one is there's always a lag. Most of the time it's imperceptible, but it's always there. It's the reason we can't say the pledge of allegiance in unison, right? Number two, you can't make eye contact. If you feel like I'm looking you in the eyes right now, it's because I've trained myself to stare at a little green dot on the top of my screen. This is me looking you in the eye, right? So the combination of the leg, the lack of eye contact makes your amygdala, the instinctual part of your brain, give you little tiny stressors that say, this person might not be trustworthy. So I'm getting a weird read on this person we're talking to right now, right? Also, God never intended us for, to be able to see ourselves when we talk to other people, to be able to see, like, to be able to see yourself while you're talking, that's sensory overload and Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So if you have anything sensitive, pick up the good old fashioned telephone and do it over the telephone. Also, if you work in an environment that is a Zoom online conference, every meeting has to be uh, camera to camera, break it up, break the day up and move some conversations to the telephone. It will really help your mental health. Um, Secondly, understand how the brain works under pressure. So most people, when they deal with long-term chronic stress, three things happen to us. Number one is we become less smart. We forget things. We, uh, we're, just, we're just not as smart. Number two, we, our executive function diminishes. We're not at the top of our game. We don't carry ourselves as well. And number three, our um, emotional intelligence, how we interact with other people, that also is damaged. So you have less patience or you have less empathy or you know you, 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 you have a shorter fuse, those types of things. When you're dealing with other people, give them space and grace to forget things, give them space and grace to, um, to, you know, to, to say stupid stuff, that's gonna happen, right? But also remember, you are also going through this. And so you should build a few tactics for yourself. And one of the best pieces of advice somebody ever gave me was, have a phrase you use when you don't want to say anything at all. Because if you're anything like me, someone says something that annoys me or takes me off guard or at, at, in any way puts me off kilter, the first words out of my mouth are never my best response nor my final response. The first words out of my mouth are usually my stupidest response, right? And so a long time ago, I developed a, my go-to phrase. And my go-to phrase is actually sound. And the sound is this, huh. Let's all try that together on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Huh. Huh. That is the signal that I make to my brain to tell my mouth to just stay shut for a moment. So your best employee walks into your office, sits down in front of you and says, I just learned that so-and-so makes more money than I do. And if I don't get a raise, I am quitting. Huh. I value you and I want to approach this properly. May I have a few hours to gather my thoughts, gather some data, gather some intel so that you and I can sit down and have a conversation that's beneficial to both of us. You rarely can go wrong if the first words out of your mouth are something along the lines of, I value you and I want to approach this properly. Um, last, last thing, celebrate. We need to be celebrating. We need to be starting new rituals. Every phase of our lives, we need to be starting new rituals. So um, I love studying how co companies and clubs and, and, and groups celebrate because what you celebrate, how you celebrate it can be such a, uh, a team builder. It, it solidifies who you are as a club or a culture, right? I'm gonna give you an example of, what do I have left? I have four minutes left. I'm gonna give you an example of two companies that I think do a really good job of what they celebrate and how they celebrate it. So the first is Highlights Magazine. Are you familiar with Highlights Magazine? Highlights Magazine is the magazine for kids that uh, has like the hidden pictures and the, the comic strips and the poems and the stories. Um, so I was uh, at a conference a few years ago and the man who was gonna speak right after me was the vice president of sales for Highlights Magazine, which made me say, huh, never occurred to me that somebody actually works at Highlights Magazine, but of course they do. So he was very interesting. And one of the things that he was saying is, it's very hard to sell Highlights Magazine. And the reason that it's hard 
is that there's actually only two people in the world who buy subscriptions. Now I'm going to see if, I don't know how, how quickly you guys can use chat or unmute yourself, but anyone want to gander a guess who buys Highlights Magazine subscriptions? Who's the, who's the target market for the sales folks at Highlights Magazine? Any guesses? Any guesses? Parents. Parents. No, no, not parents. Pediatrician. Dentists. Okay. Dentists. Dentists. Okay. For, I'm going to stop and say dentists. Ding, 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 ding. Yes. Dentists. And under dentists, I'm going to say all of the med pediatricians, eye doctors, anyone with a waiting room. Dentists is one. And grand grandparent, maybe grandparents, but mostly if we're being honest, it's grandma, right? It's grandma. Mostly it's grandma that takes care of that stuff. So you're trying to get your dentist or your grandma on the phone and sell them a subscription to the to High Life Magazine, right? So he has this award. It's called the SWSWSW Award. It stands for Some Will Buy, Some Will Not, Someone's Waiting. And you get this award when 100 people in a row have told you no. When you've been turned down 100 consecutive times, there is a big rope in the middle of the room with a big cowbell on the end of it. And you get to get up and you get to ring the heck out of this cowbell. And all of your coworkers have confetti guns under their desk and they shoot you with confetti and everyone whoops and hollers. And you're the, the, the person of the moment. And then you sit down and you make your 101st phone call. And like this fellow said, the speaker said, he said, every sales program you see will say, we reward results. He said, I can't reward results. I won't keep anyone. He said, I need to, I need people who are buoyant and optimistic and persistent and can be told no 100 times in a row and still pick up the phone and call. I reward their effort. We celebrate their effort. Second example, Apple computer. So here's setting the stage. In the olden days, if you ever had an Apple device break, you used to be able to take it to an Apple store. And at the back of the Apple store, they had a uh, counter, which they called the genius bar. And they had people whom they called geniuses who would fix your device. So I was at the Alderwood Mall Apple store a few years ago, getting my laptop worked on. And the genius said, working on it, working on it. And after a while, he turns to me and he says, oh, it's about to get loud in here. We're having a tap out. To which I responded, none of those words you just said to me made any sense. He said, oh, it's this thing we do on employees last day. I said, okay, sure enough. Now, if you could picture, I know it's hard to see me, I apologize, but if you could picture behind my head is a door that leads to the back room, right? And right in front of me is a door that spills out to the mall. Can you picture a store kind of set up that way? Back door opens, out comes a very managerial looking genius. And he says to everyone in the store, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Mackenzie who's not going to work at the Alderwood Mall Apple store anymore. She's going to Bellevue Community College. And he steps aside and out come all of these geniuses. There are so many, Apple stores are like clown cars. There are so many geniuses in the back you don't even know. And they make two rows, they make two rows. And then out comes Mackenzie, just as cute as she can be. And she starts walking through this row of her coworkers and they're hugging her and they're high-fiving her and they're taking selfies with her. And the manager has all of us customers clapping because Mackenzie's going to college. God bless America. It takes around 45 seconds to walk from the back office to the front door. And then she steps out and that's her last moment of employment at Apple Computer. I thought, no, that's genius. How do people leave your club? Your former club members, your former employees can be your best advocates. They can be your best allies. How do they leave you? Because going back to McKinsey, she worked retail at a suburban shopping mall. You know that girl put up with a lot of crap in her job, but you could see those memories fading away and being replaced by memories of love as she walked through this row of her coworkers. Now, had McKinsey like stolen an iPad, I'm sure there's a different door for those employees, which we do not see. Um, okay, so usually I stop right here and ask what rituals you've started, but I think we're sort of running out of time. No, I would say, um, go, um, Sherry, this is Sue. Um, go ahead and you can run till about um, uh, 12.53 and then we'll have some time for okay. questions and wrap at one. That'd be great. Okay, perfect then. So talk to me about what rituals have you started during the pandemic? And that can be at work, it could be at your club, it could be personally. Let's talk about something good. What, what have we started that we think that we want to continue as the pandemic winds down? Do you have any, do you have any um, daily walks? Yes, daily walks with the family. This picture right here that you see, that's actually where I walk every day, that's near my house. 
Anything else? Working from home, you have tea time with my husband every day at 10. Oh, and the dog gets a snack. Yes, that is, you know, that's, that's quality of life stuff right there. Anyone else? Weekly lunch with grandchildren who are remote learning. Okay, yeah, I, I'm sure your children appreciate you taking that on. I make sure to call family members who I use, yep, going outside, not just sitting at a desk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that the pandemic did is it like made us certainly focus on our mental health in ways that we sort of just took for granted before. Um, oh my gosh, pork loin sandwich during Rotary and a drink. <sighs> Makes me hungry and thirsty. Anything else? Okay. So now I'm, uh, the thing masks and healthcare will be here to stay. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 I hope. You know, there's a couple. There's there's several things I hope stick around. But one thing that I hope sticks around is if you are not feeling well, you wear a mask. Like that. Like that seems like sort of like a yeah. You know, if you are sick, why don't you wear a mask or stay home? Um. Okay. Yes. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read to you just a page from my book. And I like reading this, the chapter is called, There's No Such Thing as a Family Secret. And I like reading it to Rotarians because it's very four-way test-ish in its sentiment. And the, 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 the chapter is called, There's No Such Thing as a Family Secret. And it's really about um, the way that you treat people will always see the light of day. And, and, and the chapter is a cautionary tale, you know, don't be a, don't be a jerk at work is, is basically what it is because, you know, you treat your employees shabby, they're going to treat your customers. You treat your club members poorly. They're not going to represent you well in the community, right? That goes without saying. But you know what the pandemic really highlighted for me that I never really thought of is the opposite is true. And I, and I know I'm preaching in the choir when I say this, but it is like our Rotary Clubs were built for this pandemic, wasn't it? I mean, our true colors really came through at the very beginning of the pandemic. Almost every Rotary Club was had all the pieces in place to really mobilize and become very quickly pillars of strength in our communities. You know, we had the, we had the connections, we had the means, we had the, the um, initiative, we had the, the motivation to, to really help out. And, you know, like listening to, to what you're doing um, just within your club is really amazing. Okay, I'll stop because I, you guys all know this. All right. There's no such thing as a family secret. So when I was a few months pregnant with Johanna, who's my third child, I had to pick up three of my vendors from the airport. They were going to spend a week working at my credit union. So we decided to have dinner on their first night in Seattle. As luck would have it, my childcare fell through at the very last minute. My husband was working on a movie. So I had to take my two young daughters to dinner with me. As three-year-old Rebecca warmed up to the three men, she began to chat. You know what she asked them? One time, daddy ate all of mommy's cookies that she keeps in her car for when she gets hungry. He took her car to ski patrol and he ate all the cookies. And when, she, when he got home, mommy said, don't eat all the cookies. You just eat one cookie and then you stop. And one time I throwed up in the car in a bowl and daddy couldn't go to the football game because I throwed up. But one time mommy threw up in the sink. She threw up in the sink because she has a baby in her tummy and it makes her a little sick sometimes. I don't want my vendors knowing that once barfed in my own sink, gross. But I really didn't want them to know that I keep a stash of cookies in my car for whenever I get hungry. But I really didn't want anyone to know that I once yelled at my poor husband because he ate the car stash cookies. But if you're a parent of a child who's old enough to speak, you know that everything, but everything is always fair game for the telling. So when my book first came out, Rebecca was six years old and I had a stack of them on the kitchen table and I was making dinner and she came in and she pulled one off, she saw her name. So of course she started reading. Suddenly she slammed the book shut. She said, seriously, mom, you told the whole world I threw up in the car. And I looked at her and I had the dreadful, overwhelming realization. My business book, my MBA book is written at a first grade reading level. <laughs> When this is all over, I'm going to ask every employer that I ever interview with, tell me how you treated your employees during the pandemic. I think this sentiment is also true for Rotarians. I think a lot of people are looking at us right now and understanding what we're really made of. 
So that is my presentation. Um, really quickly, those are all the ways, if you ever want a professional public speaker, those are all the ways you can get a hold of me. Right here is, this is a link to, to, to buy my book. Um, and I will tell you, it's $15, a signed copy, $15. I can take cash, check, credit cards, or Bitcoin. Just kidding. I know nothing about Bitcoin, but it does make an excellent gift. And Mother's Day is right around the corner. That is my presentation. Do you have questions or comments? Yeah, we'll start with Chain has a question. I can, great presentation, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. For your enthusiasm and your good points. I'm curious, what did you start doing during COVID that you'll continue to do? Besides drinking, you must drink a lot of coffee. But besides that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I started meditating. Um, I use the Calm app. That's one thing. Um, you know, I started, uh, okay, and I'm going to say this, and it's so dorky. It's so, but I'm going to say it anyway. So one of the things that I started doing is I started reaching out to Rotaries like your club. Um, not, yes, to practice, to practice doing presentations because they're hard. But also what I quickly learned is that uh, Rotary, they're my tribe, they're my people. And just being with Rotaries all over the country and just hearing what people are doing and how they're helping. And like, um, it, it helped a lot. That's weird. I, but also, I have this daydream sort of um, fantasy that I want to, when everything is open back up, I want to do a Rotary road trip where I just go and visit every club that invited me to speak on Zoom and visit them in person and have lunch with you and break bread and just like meet, meet you all in real life. So hopefully that pans out. Yeah, I hope so. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be great. But yeah, I did Rotary. That's... <laughs> So I have a, this yeah. is too, I have a, I have a question for you um, and see, I have to practice where I am too. People wonder why my, <laughs> um, so when you were talking about um, kind of the, the brain science around things and also with all the presentations and conversations you've had via Zoom, how do you manage when you have a group of folks that are just staring poker faced? <laughs> which is is usually the case right I yep, mean it's yep. uh I mean they're watching a computer screen that you you know and yeah um you you what do what do I so the very first time I did a presentation on zoom I got off the call and just said oh my god I am the worst that was horrible that was but the thing is you just have to keep doing it and you just have to think uh and trust, tr trust that people are listening, trust that they are enjoying you and, and, and not take what you're seeing, not, not, not overly interpret it, you know, like not, you know, you're going to have people on zoom fall asleep. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like that's just, but you know, that you just have to trust that the people you're, you're speaking to are getting a, at least a little bit out of it and just forge ahead and not, and just yeah. thicken your skin, just like, just yep. be like, you know what? It's, it's all good. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. And I wasn't referring to this group, but, but when you're in various meetings, right. If somebody doesn't have a response, it's just a kind of a stare down. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's and yeah. You, you, and you know, you, you, you can't, you, assume the best, uh, you can't assume the worst. You need to assume the best, you know, you just need to assume they're listening. They have, you know, uh, they're, they're engaged and just because their face doesn't show, it doesn't mean that it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And Renee was asking your acronym highlights acronym. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, oh, I that have was to say, just a comment on oh. what you were saying. When you were speaking <laughs> yeah. to someone, some are going to be engaged, some aren't. And, you know, the next time you go to a meeting, there's going to be other people oh. waiting. <laughs> there you go. Right. Yes. There you some go. will listen, some will not. Someone's. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love it, Renee. I love it. Yeah, very good. Very good. Other comments or questions for Sherry? And if you're raising your hand, I apologize if I'm missing it right now. Righty. Well, I thoroughly, I think we all did. I 
I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it Thank was you. informational, but um, I'm looking forward to reading your book too, because it's, it's funny how a lot of those parenting things do come into play when you're, when you're doing your job, right? So, so I'll have to ask my kids what secrets I've told on them <laughs> inadvertently thinking it was funny and it probably wasn't, right? So very good. All right, well, um, Sherry, thanks again so much for coming and in your honor, we're going to make a, a gift to our very own Salem Rotary Foundation, which does good works in our community for children and families. So thanks again for, for joining us. It was very, very enjoyable. So thank you. Thank, thank you all, take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thanks. Um, all righty, as we wrap up next week, Russ McCracken is our program chair and our guest will be Sean Irvine um, to shine a light on what's happening in independence. So don't know what that is. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing about it. So with that, I'm wishing you a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful rest of your week. And we will see you next Wednesday. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.